today's episode of the ESG Beat, we will speak with Brian Tomlinson, Director of Research at CECP's CEO Investor Forum. CECP stands for Chief Executives for Corporate Purpose and is a CEO-led coalition that believes that a company's social strategy, including stakeholder engagement, determines its success. Today, we will discuss a recent report co-authored by CECP entitled ESG and the Earnings Call, which advocates for integrating ESG and long-term strategy into the earnings call. Welcome to the ESG Beat, Brian. Thanks, Amelia. Good to be with you. So before we get into your specific role, let's start with CECP, or Chief Executive for Corporate Purpose. Can you tell us about your mission? Yeah, absolutely. So I work for the CEO Investor Forum within CECP. And the CEO Investor Forum was uh, created to respond to the concerns that we have around short term capital markets. Um, There's a concern expressed by both CEOs and investors that our capital markets are too short term and that that has negative impacts both for companies. for investors and for uh, the wider society. Uh, And we know that there are interaction effects between the capital markets uh, and managerial decision-making that can cause managers to behave myopically, uh, which destroys value over the long-term, even though it may be rational over the short-term. So one of the things that we've been doing over the last few years is to pull together these CEO investor forums which is an opportunity for a CEO to come and talk in a Reg FD setting uh, to uh, a mixture of uh, investors um, to talk about a longer term time horizon and a broader set of themes than they tend to do in other uh, investor facing settings. Uh, And so far we've had really good uptake from uh, leading CEOs and investors over $2 trillion in market cap uh, across sectors has presented a long-term plan. And each of our CEO investor forums has been uh, attended by investors representing AUM of uh, generally over 20 to 25 trillion. So this is really a uh, subject that the capital markets, uh, both on the issuer side and the investor side, are interested in. And the CEO Investor Forum is part of the broader organization of chief executives for corporate purpose, which was founded a little over 20 years ago by Wall Street luminaries like John Whitehead from Goldman Sachs and uh, by uh, Paul Newman, uh, actor and philanthropist and uh, American businessman. Uh, You'll know him from the salad dressings. Um, And that was established with the broad mission that CEOs and, and corporations ought to be a force for good in society. And that started off with a somewhat kind of philanthropic focus. Um, And increasingly, what we're seeing is that companies are wanting to talk much more about how they're integrating their social strategy into their core business strategy. So uh, essentially, what we're we're doing is really trying to respond uh, both in the capital market side and then in the broader corporate side to this kind of emerging paradigm of uh, corporate purpose and the the sort of expanded expectations for the corporation's role in society. So I wanted to go back a bit to have you explain what do you mean uh, for those of us in our audience who aren't familiar with a Reg FD setting? What does that mean? Yeah, Reg FD very simply uh, is just the uh, a regulation passed uh, a number of years ago which has the intention of ensuring that you treat your investors equally. So in your disclosures, you're not giving one class of shareholders or one group of shareholders a preferred access to market sensitive information. Um, so one of the practical effects of this, for instance, uh, just by way of example, is that at our our CEO investor forums, as with other uh, large uh, investor conferences are live streamed. So the investors in the room uh, are not being treated any differently than the investors who are not in the room. Um, And then companies obviously make those presentations available on their IR platforms. So it's about the fair treatment 
you know, the clue is in the name, the fair treatment, fair disclosure um, to your investors. And it's essentially, you know, a, a supplements the um, you know, existing uh, uh, um, information, the existing regulation around things like um, insider trading. Okay, thank you for that clarification. I, I wanted to, um, before we move on to your specific role, I wanted to ask sort of a big picture question. Um, and it's on corporate purpose, which is something that we've talked about a lot in the past. From your vantage point, how have you seen the evolution of corporate purpose and business purpose from the perspective of CEOs? Uh, you said that your organization started with a philanthropic um, focus. Uh, you know, how has that changed? And in particular, over the last, let's say, three years? Yeah, I, I think the main kind of barometer of, of change there uh, that many people will be familiar with is the business roundtable statement made in uh, August last year, uh, where CEOs, uh, 181 of them, um, said that the guiding uh, focus, the purpose of their corporation was to serve uh, all their stakeholders. And then they provided a list of stakeholders, um, including uh, suppliers, uh, employees, and shareholders. Now, you know, what's significant about that is that, of course, that sounds like a move away to some degree to the sort of shareholder primacy view of uh, why a company exists. Um, now, of course, making that uh, business roundtable statement doesn't necessarily have any practical legal implications because the, the fiduciary duty of investors of uh, directors is not adjusted by that. So companies have to think about how they are sort of modeling their behavior and their stakeholder approach, but within the existing legal framework that exists um, for them. And I think really this is just a developing area that companies are um, thinking about more closely. Um, so for instance, you'll see in the response to the COVID cr crisis, uh, companies have been taking steps to ensure that their workers uh, receive uh, fair pay, increased pay to re re uh, reflect the hazards they are facing, um, other improved aspects of the employment relationship around a paid holiday and sick leave and so on. Now, in the middle of a pandemic, these are sensible business decisions, but I think the thought is that also, uh, uh, well, for various reasons, including you know reputation and the stability of the business and so on, but there's also the sense that these are representative of a kind of variety of management which is more focused on um, the stakeholders within the business uh, rather than taking the sort of short term view, which is to pursue uh, you know cost cutting or, or other measures which may uh, be good for earnings in the short term, but may uh, be you know, bad for the business, its reputation, uh, its access to human capital and so on um, over the long term. So I think it's really an emerging paradigm that companies are working out um, what they can do um, to make it a real thing that the company is managing towards and you're seeing a variety of responses. So now let's focus on, on your role. As Director of Research, uh, we are going to delve into your recent report, ESG and the earnings call, but can you give us a sense of some of your other work? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so as I said, you know, our uh, meta concern is that the capital markets are too short term. Uh, that's a concern broadly shared by both many CEOs uh, and many um, investors. So a consensus uh, that short-termism is a problem, less of a consensus about what to do about it. Um, so as I said, we've been convening CEO investor forums to provoke a more long-term focused conversation in the capital markets. But in order to enable that, what we wanted to do was provide uh, meaningful 
guidance to companies about how they can then shape their disclosures toward the long term. And that's really where the majority of my focus has been. So over the last few years, we've developed a different, uh, different bits of guidance which companies can engage with uh, to help them on that, uh, engage with that long-term imperative. Uh, so firstly, we have a, a long-term plan framework consisting of nine themes and 22 line items uh, across a mix of themes from uh, uh, long-term focused corporate governance themes, human capital, financial performance, capital allocation, uh, really the elements that a company needs to talk about to deliver a meaningful, uh, rigorous uh, long-term plan. Uh, that was developed uh, in combination with Professor George Serafine at Harvard Business School uh, and KKS advisors. Uh, and it's, it's really the kind of first place that we ask companies to think about going when they uh, are building a, a long-term plan. And that builds on prior guidance that we put out, uh, such as a uh, letter to CEOs from institutional investors, um, which was signed by people like Vanguard, State Street, Wellington, uh, New York Common, among others, which early in the process was intended to just set out some very high level guidance around long termism. And then to support that, we have principles based guidance, which is set out in a paper called Emerging Practice. Uh, in long-term plans, where we really identify what the kind of success factors for a long-term plan are. Um, and then to enable companies to kind of operationally get their arms around this, we then have um, another paper, which is called the method of production of long-term plans, um, where we give companies some insight into how they can set up their operational processes to talk more about the long-term in their investor uh, presentations and across a broader set of themes. Because our realization, very often talking to companies, is that disclosure operates as a forcing function. In order to disclose new things, you have to do new things. So very often you'll have to build new internal collaboration processes. You'll have to um, uh, expand access to particular data sets across teams you then actually have to do quite extensive uh, kind of mind share uh, across teams. The one that we often focus on is uh, the interaction between investor relations, which obviously holds the disclosure relationship with capital markets and corporate sustainability, which holds the sustainability data um, and getting these two teams to collaborate on an ongoing basis and co-develop the disclosures that go to the capital markets. Um, and also link into that conversation, the uh, corporate secretarial function, which obviously holds those disclosures that go in the proxy statement, among other things, which are of real interest to the long-term focused investors who uh, are particularly focused on how they vote the proxy. Um, so it's kind of a suite of guidance to just uh, give companies a uh, easy way of starting to access um, this imperative. And it builds on guidance from hundreds of institutional investors, lots of other organizations working in this space. And one of the things that we were really focused on was uh, to not duplicate uh, what, what is already existing, but to amplify it. So in order to um, deliver the type of information that I think is gonna be decision relevant and useful to institutional investors, one of the things in the ESG space that we ask companies to do is to report against the SASB framework um, as part of delivering a long-term plan to provide context and materiality focused disclosures on ESG to the, uh, to, to, to the capital market. So really leveraging a lot of the existing work that's already been done, but really trying to focus um, a company's disclosure efforts on, on what's important. And just, just a, a, final, a final point on that was that we, um, we did a paper um, where we looked at the existing disclosures of an oil and gas company. Well, let's just call them ExxonMobil because uh, we wanted to uh, find out uh, how many pieces of disclosure does it take to understand a company's long-term plan? And the punchline is, well, way too many. Uh, you know, there's been this disclosure kind of a, a, a explosion in the disclosure ecosystem over the last decade or so, mostly a very good thing because companies are talking about 
uh, more value relevant themes, um, but they're doing that across a huge array of documents. And in order to, to get a sense of uh, how um, Exxon were doing on these themes in our framework, uh, we had, even at a boilerplate level of detail, we had to look at over 13 individual pieces of disclosure across uh, you know, Ks, Qs, uh, and, uh, and then obviously vo uh, voluntary disclosure, sustainability reports, website disclosures, and then also uh, the reports of the following analysts. Uh, you know, so good effort on transparency, but also perhaps more focus required. And that's one of the things that we're really trying to get companies to do, to tell a coherent story about long-term to the capital markets. So you said something really interesting that I want to amplify a little bit, which is the information forcing function of disclosure. So when I've observed companies um, who really commit to disclosure, Salesforce is a good example, their process is very cross-functional. And so legal and sustainability and public policy and the CFO are all, and IR of course, are all working in concert. Um, but I think what is often unappreciated is it's not only that they're collaborating on new sustainability or ESG initiatives and commitments, it's that they're sharing information that they wouldn't otherwise be sharing across corporate silos. So has that been your observation too with respect to companies that embrace disclosure? Yeah, yeah, that's, the, that's right. And, and a number of the companies that we've talked to have uh, told us that after engaging with us to deliver one of these, develop and deliver one of these long-term plans, that the mix of disclosures that they're presenting to the capital markets changed durably. Um, so that, that essentially means that, you know, there are, there's information that it, they had access to internally, you know, over the time horizon that we're working with companies, they're not going to be able to build you know, the new data sets and systems that, uh, you know, would, you'd need to construct in order to access new information. They have the information available, but through those collaborative efforts, it has then changed the mix of information they are disclosing because it's filtering into different parts of the company. And, you know, that, 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 that can only be a, a, a good thing, you know, uh, uh, unsiloing uh, information. And, and, you know, there are these pressures, I, I think, as well, on the individual uh, functions themselves to engage more broadly and more deeply with other parts of the business. So we work very closely with the National Investor Relations Institute um, and you know, they produced an ESG policy statement um, last year, which they cite our uh, guidance to companies on long-termism and how long-termism and ESG are so clo closely um, aligned. Um, and, you know, so that sort of external encouragement uh, is going to mean that in addition to, you know, receiving questions from investors um, in, in a variety of different settings, that there is this kind of imperative to kind of reach across the silos um, and, and engage in an ongoing sort of non-reactive way. Okay, so now let's move to uh, your report. Um, ESG and the earnings call. Let's start with the earnings call. Can you break down for our audience, uh, those of us who are not familiar, what is its purpose traditionally? And then we'll, we'll move into the report itself. Right, so uh, at, a, at a very high level in, in the United States, uh, mandatory uh, quarterly report, sorry, quarterly reporting of earnings is mandatory. Uh, so listed companies will produce um, a, a, a 10Q, um, and it, accompanying uh, the release of that information, a company will have an earnings call where they uh, contextualize and provide commentary around the information they are um, disclosing. Uh, if you, in a recent uh, academic survey of investor relations professionals, uh, over 80% of those surveyed said that the earnings call was the most important forum in which they uh, uh, developed their equity narrative with the capital markets. So it is important. Um, the concern 
in the context of long-termism is that the earnings call might be a source of uh, short-term pressures. Now, we think that quarterly reporting itself is fine. There's nothing inherently wrong with quarterly reporting. I think there are all sorts of transparency benefits uh, that, that come from that. We think things like quarterly earnings guidance are much less useful. We're, essentially, that is where a company says, uh, next quarter, we will be, we, we will be at X metric, usually a sort of earnings per share uh, metric. Now, in addition to the work that goes into producing the outputs for the earnings call, also then producing guidance, uh, I think encourages a quite a lot of short-term focus within management teams and also encourages the capital markets to then focus on really short-term uh, financial information. So we think short-term guidance is uh, not valuable um, and we think companies can uh, deliver much longer term financial guidance and, and many are increasingly doing that. Um, you know, you see the number of companies that are delivering sort of one to three year financial guidance is, is, is steadily increasing and there are a number of uh, investor surveys uh, such as that conducted by FCLT uh, Global which indicate that you know, the preferred time horizon over which investors would like to receive guidance is certainly not the quarter, it's actually a much longer um, period. So I think you know, to, to take from that, the earnings call is important. The earnings call moves markets, but it has often been calibrated in a very short-term uh, focused fashion, which isn't an inevitable feature of a conversation that you have quarterly. So now let's move to ESG um, and how that interacts with the earnings call um, and the problem that your report is trying to solve for. Before we do that, if you could tell us how you're defining ESG. Is it, is it a proxy for long-termism? Yeah, I think, I think they're closely related, um, but not coterminous. Uh, so I think ESG is an important element of your forward story. And in order to talk compellingly and convincingly about your long-term strategy, that is going to involve uh, a discussion of those key underlying environmental, social, and governance metrics uh, and themes. Uh, and depending on the sector that you're in, that will depend on which ESG issues that you need to talk about and focus on within each of the E, S, and G uh, elements. So, you know, we're talking about ESG in the context of how is it affecting your uh, operational performance and your financial prospects. Um, uh, so, so we, hence the reliance uh, for us in terms of our ESG disclosures on something like the SASB. Uh, framework. However, when we talk about ESG, we do accept that uh, that um, company-focused financial materiality frame might not be enough to uh, talk about how well situated a company is in terms of ESG. Um, so you will have to talk about, you know, uh, depending again on the sector, on the industry. Uh, how your business is affecting wider society, because that may be a key element in how durable and sustainable your earnings are over time. But overall, it, a, it's an investor-facing financial materiality take on ESG. Okay, that's really interesting. And I want to just pause on that nuance, because I think it's very important. Um, Financial materiality is important. And that's what the SASB standards look at. But your focus is a little bit broader because you want to know not only what's financially material today, but because of your long-term focus, what might become financially material. And that might not be material right now, but you still want to engage with that. that that's absolutely right. That's absolutely right. And one of the ways that we get there um, is by encouraging companies to talk about the mega trends that 
their business is exposed to. So, you know, if you look at our, our societies across the developed West, there are clear megatrends that are impacting our societies on a, on a, on a clear society-wide scale, whether or not that's uh, aging populations, um, upward spiraling healthcare costs, uh, exploding levels of indebtedness, both corporate and, uh, and other and governmental, these large trends, are, uh, automation and so on, large trends affecting societies. Um, but ultimately those trends are going to land asymmetrically within sectors in the same way that ESG issues will land asymmetrically within sectors, particularly ENS. E um, so it's incumbent on companies to talk about those uh, over the relevant time horizon that they're going to impact um, the business. Um, so we've had a number of companies that I think have done a pretty good job um, of trying to talk about this. Um, now, of course, you know, it's, it, talking about this is filled with uncertainty. Um, but of course, one of the things that you're uh, demonstrating, that a management team is demonstrating by talking about these issues, is that you have an understanding of how they may affect the development of your strategy over time um, and the resilience of that strategy and, and how it may need to change. Um, so, you know, if you're a, if you're a, you know, car company, uh, several years ago, you would have probably known, uh, if you were looking at the industry over an appropriately long time horizon, that, uh, electrification, active safety and automation were going to become core elements, um, of your business, uh, because it's informed by, you know, the accompanying megatrends and how they're landing in your sector. Um, and the other uh, uh, concept that we started to introduce to companies is this concept which we take from the recent Sarah Feynman Rogers page, paper called Pathways to Materiality, um, where we ask uh, companies to, to think about, again, what are the issues that might not be relevant now, but will become material over time. Um, so I think about, for instance, the way in which our attitudes to plastic waste have changed. Uh, you know, if you have a business which is heavily reliant on the sale of bottled water, particularly in the developed West, um, you probably want, you probably are in a better position now if you had had an analysis ongoing of the issues arising from the safe disposal of plastic waste. Um, and, you know, thinking about the process which has caused plastic waste to go from essentially a non-issue to a major issue um, and trying to understand how that's happened um, over time. Um, so there's, there is obviously intrinsic uncertainty in, in companies engaging with these issues but it's a way of demonstrating that A, we're aware of the long-term vulnerabilities of the business. Uh, we're thinking in a sophisticated way about it and we're preparing uh, the way in which we think about applying capital to respond to them where they're material to strategy. It's almost as if there should be a, a disclosure standard for potentially material. Right. Right. I mean, look, we, we are constantly asking companies uh, to talk more about the long term and to provide in the parlance forward looking information. Uh, and in fact, in the context of COVID-19, the Securities and Exchange Commission um, has put out some quite encouraging guidance uh, where they say, you know, look, in the context of this pandemic, forward looking information is particularly important. Uh, the regulator is not going to try to safe uh, to second guess you. There is a permissive safe harbor for disclosing forward-looking information, which you should avail yourselves of. And and of course, our uh, response to that was yes, forward-looking information is particularly important now, uh, as it is the rest of the time. <laughs> That's fascinating. So. So back to the report, the issue that you're trying to solve for, it seems, is not the quarterly reporting itself, but rather the particular topics that are on the agenda during the earnings call. 
So um, tell us more about that and break down the key takeaways, please, of the report. Yeah, thanks. Um, so yeah, th there's been, as I said, the concern is that um, ESG has not really been part of the earnings call discourse. And I think there are various reasons um, for that. Um, some of which stem from uh, concerns uh, reported to us by, uh, you know, the key constituents of the earnings call, basically, you know, the, the sell side analysts who are the key consumers of earnings call disclosures, and then the teams on the corporate side who then create the disclosures for the earnings call. Um, so on the sell side, we heard a, a range of concerns, you know, um, not yet clear uh, how uh, the sell side is in the short term can incorporate ESG disclosures into their models. Uh, concern that ESG disclosures are going to be boilerplate and kind of wishy-washy and may detract from the real kind of crunchy financial information that they actually need to do the work of being um, a sell side analyst. So there's that concern that, you know, there's an existing well-known choreography and set of disclosures, which we need and introducing this stuff into it um, may get in the way. And when you say crunchy, you mean crunchy in the numbers sense and not in the Berkeley sense. Just wanted to clarify that. Cr crunchy in the numbers sense. Uh, <laughs> hard, well-known, generally accepted accounting principles. <laughs> um, and then on the uh, on the corporate side, you see the sort of concomitant worries about you know uh, introducing new disclosures that the analysts aren't interested in, uh, frustrating them. Um, a concern again, as ESG is in that pre-gap phase of uh, disclosing metrics in a way which can't easily be compared to your peers and not having certainty about the way your peers are disclosing if they're disclosing at all. Um, and so therefore, again, introducing uncertainty into the, into the equity story. Um, and there's also just the issue of, of time horizon. You know, the financial reporting, which is made available in the earnings call is available quarterly. Uh, many ESG issues may not be available to be reported on quarterly. Um, and so there's that issue of, uh, how do you incorporate something that's available annually into a into a context which is essential, which is quarterly in in, in nature? Um, so I think that's the that's the concern. I mean, what, stepping back, what what we're essentially saying is, uh, at a very high level, um, and this is something I think many of investors have been very clear on in the last few years, which is. Um, it's hard to get a holistic understanding of where earnings come from uh, and how sustainable those are and the likelihood of those being subjected to um, shocks, whether through scandal, reputational damage and others, uh, unless you understand a company's uh, ESG story and key financially material um, ESG metrics. Uh, so that's essentially the premise. Um, and, and to go a little further into that, you know, as I've mentioned, there's been this explosion of the reporting ecosystem, right? Um, manifested in a variety of different ways. I mean, to highlight a few, obviously you now have the broad uptake of sustainability reporting. Many, many more companies every year uh, adopting the um, architecture that SASB provides for reporting on ESG. Uh, more and more companies in response to the demand from the large index funds, building more ESG disclosure into the proxy statement. And then some leading companies, J&J &J and Philips, for example, have started convening ESG calls, which is not an earnings call. It is literally just a call to discuss the ESG performance of the business because it is such a rich topic. Some investors need more information. And it's a good opportunity for the company to kind of deepen that discussion. Um, but ultimately, if these ESG issues are important material to a company's um, financial prospects and operating performance, then 
they have to be part of mm -hmm. the key uh, venue in which a company shares its equity story with the capital markets, which is the earnings call. So that's that. And in many ways, it's almost like we've talked about breaking down the internal, the internal kind of function silos within companies. This is part of that broader effort to break down the disclosure silos. Do you think part of the reason that ESG has been absent or largely absent from the earnings calls, as you point out, is that it's been underappreciated as a way to mitigate systemic risk? I think that's absolutely right. And it's, I think it's, there's always the concern around quantification, right? How do we quantify the impact of an ESG, of, of ESG performance on the financial outcomes, right? How do we draw that bright line between the two? And a lot of that is just mm -hmm. to do with providing narrative and, and commentary around that to, to, to explain um, that link. Um, but I think essentially, you know, ESG really began to be accepted as, as we understood it as a risk mitigation tool. Um, and one of the things that you're seeing, and this is absolutely hot off the press and pleased to report, given that we uh, released our ESG in the earnings call paper just uh, around a month ago, is we've really started to see the first evidence of um, sell-side analysts incorporating uh, ESG analysis uh, into buy-sell hold decisions. Um, now, are they leading their note with ESG and saying that it's the only thing that informed the buy, sell, hold decision or, or upgrade or downgrade decision, depending on which parlance you want to use? No, it, it is part of the uh, value picture that they have um, formed of that company. Um, and that's hugely encouraging um, because ultimately, if the sell side are trying to use ESG uh, as part of that ongoing, you know, uh, valuation analysis, um, then it's incumbent on companies to disclose it in that key disclosure forum in which they interact with their analysts. So I think you've made a very convincing case, and it's it's a little bit cheating because you maybe you're preaching to the to the choir, um, <laughs> but I. Um, I know in your report, you've made a compelling case, and today you have that ESG is a proper topic for earnings calls. So the why we've addressed, but what about the how? What does your report say about precisely how to address the hurdles, which make it challenging to incorporate ESG into the earnings call forum? Yeah, so our we the recommendations in our report are really focused on corporations. Um, uh, that that is our kind of primary focus within chief executives for corporate purpose, and uh, we really want to uh, provide companies with user friendly uh, information uh, and recommendations, building on the long term plan framework that we've um, provided before. Uh, and in a sense, you know, it, that's the meta framing of this for us is to link that longer term accountability environment that you create by providing longer term focused disclosures with that shorter term accountability environment every quarter. So they, there's kind of a connective tissue between them and they, they, they relate um, to each other. So the recommendations kind of fit in a number of um, different buckets. Um, one is to really use the, um, uh, the schedule of the earnings call for every year. Um, to begin incorporating uh, ESG metrics into it. Again, ESG metrics, not for the sake of ESG metrics, but ESG metrics that relate to, uh, you know, risk, financial prospects, operational performance, you know, real uh, and, and long-term strategy. Um, so how do, you, how do you go about using the earnings call um, uh, schedule um, and a number of companies are doing, uh, doing that in different ways. Uh, some have picked, uh, say, one earnings call a year to do a deep dive into a particular the, uh, product, which has involved lots of commentary around the sustainability performance of that product. 
other companies are using uh, the macro framing that the CEO provides in the uh, in uh, a couple of the earnings calls to provide a deeper dive um, into um, ESG characteristics and sort of approaches to shared value and, and corporate purpose, which we talked about earlier. Um, you know, there's a lot of theater involved in the earnings call. So one of the things that we have suggested is that uh, IROs use the um, existing tools at their disposal to try to focus on ESG themes. So to encourage their leading analysts to ask uh, questions on ESG topics. Um, that are of uh, that, that are of relevance and right now during COVID nineteen is an obvious time for ESG themes to start appearing in the um, in the earnings call context. So there's that sense of using the um, using the existing architecture of the earnings call. Then there's some of the internal process uh, uh, approaches that we've uh, talked about. Um, lots on internal collaboration uh, and sharing. Uh, setting up govern governance processes to securely oversee, uh, particularly ENS um, performance. So those are all um, set out in the report. Um, and then again, some recommendations uh, around uh, metrics and narrative, uh, which companies can adapt um, to tell you know, their unique um, value story. Um, but again, the whole emphasis of this is an integrated discussion, you know, to not do the kind of, uh, you know, the, 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 the normal earnings call discussion and then, you know, tack on, tack on some ESG at the end. It's about, you know, relating that um, through the whole, through the whole story uh, and using it to talk about resilience, performance uh and other key and other key themes yeah i especially like your focus on resilience which is a term that we've been hearing a lot lately and you know the relationship between resilience and and dsg um well sadly we are at uh, the end of our chat um but be before we go i always like to give our guests a magic wand and crystal ball is a parting gift uh, so I'll start with the magic wand. If you could wave your magic wand and change something about the way that companies approach the earning call or even ESG more broadly, what would that be? That is a very difficult question. Uh, it's an extremely difficult question. Um, ultimately, I think one of the determinants of the success of ESG uh, is whether or not C-suite is bought into uh, the concepts and understands the potential impacts. Uh, for instance, understanding that it's not about uh, corporate citizenship and do-goodery. It's about how you make your money, how robust is that, how sustainable is it over time. So I think just that that framing that the C-suite is engaged and that the C-suite gets it, because I think an awful lot follows from that. I will give you your crystal ball. Where do you see us headed? Uh, I think that the broad trends that we face uh, as a society and also in our capital markets inevitably means that uh, corporations, investors, the capital markets generally are going to have to engage with long-termism and forward-looking information um, more and more. You can see the trends around that, you know, whether it's, as I mentioned earlier, the encouragement from, from the SEC to focus more on forward-looking information um, and to be confident about delivering it, whether you see it's, you know, even the sell-side analysts engaging with ESG in their work, um, just, just engaging with uh, the mega trends and the extreme uncertainties over time that are going to impact the way businesses operate, if they can meet social expectations. Um, I think it's going to be a, a more forward-looking world. Well, I certainly hope that you're right, and I look forward to continuing this conversation with you 
And I thank you for your time today and also uh, just for your thought leadership uh, on ESG. Absolute pleasure to uh, talk with you. I'm Amelia Miazad from Berkeley Law. Thank you for staying on the ESG beat with me today.